So, assalamu alaikum. I know we're at different times of day because there are folks in Malaysia. And so, assalamu alaikum works for whatever your time zone is. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. Um, get ready because this is going to be an interactive session. Um, so, I hope you all be willing to participate. We're not a huge group in the 60s, so hopefully, you'll all have uh, be able to, to participate in the chat at least. Um, and uh, Rosemary, can you just confirm that if sometimes someone wants to unmute, we can ask them to unmute? Do, we do they have that permission to unmute? We can indeed, we yep. Perfect, awesome, thank you so much. All right, and this is my Twitter handle. If you'd like to tweet out uh, something, you can tweet out my slides or screenshots of my slides, I don't mind. I'd be happy to see what resonated for you. Um, and actually I was in a session recently where someone said, you know, if you like something in particular, let me know in the chat or plus one or something. So. Uh, feel free to do that as well if you want. But I'll be asking you a lot of questions that require actual typing, so get ready for that. All right, and um, before we start, I always like to ask, how are you feeling uh, at the beginning of a session? And also, where are you? Because I know there are people in different countries, and also there are people outside of uh, Harriet Watt who are in the session. And then uh, I got this image of these guinea pigs because we just got guinea pigs like last week. <laughs> so I was asking you on Twitter, I want to integrate guinea pigs into my keynote. So someone shared this like guinea pig scale of how you're feeling. Uh, but I think you could just express with words if none of these expresses how you're feeling right now. So let me know, how are you feeling and where are you? Kind of like sleepless in Seattle. So. Nine in sunny Malaysia. <laughs> Is it cold? <laughs> All right, you're, almost, you're six, Richard? Okay, that's good. Smiling guinea pig. <laughs> Five in Glasgow. Lots of sixes, that's great to hear. Dubai, I'm feeling great. Namath, thank you. Bristol, UK, you're an eight. The eight is a very cute one. Five, not a morning person, I can understand. A four in Salisbury, nine in Cape Town. <laughs> All right, one in Malaysia. Sleepy but excited here. <laughs> All right, fabulous to be here. Yeah, guinea pigs are gorgeous, I agree. <laughs> it's, it's a very unexpected cuteness, I think. <laughs> Startled in the borders, okay. So Scotland, Dubai, lots of people from Dubai, Malaysia, obviously in Scotland, Scottish borders, Malta. Hi, James. 23, where's 23? <laughs> or maybe two or three, somewhere between the two and the three. All right, lots of people are feeling the one, so I'm guessing it's very sunny, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you for sharing. And you know, throughout this pandemic, I've I've always asked at the beginning, how people are feeling, whether it's a meeting or whether it's a class session. I think because it's a roller coaster of ups and downs these days because we're you know heading towards summer, things are slowing down. But during the semester, a lot of times people are exhausted or overwhelmed. And sometimes there's something that's happened and people have a lot of strong feelings. Um, so for today, I've just checked in with you. We're gonna do a quick chatter fall where I'm gonna ask a question, ask you all to participate in the chat. Then I'll talk about equity, care, and compassion by design and ask you to share examples from your own practice, because I think these are things that have been on everyone's minds uh, over the past 15 months. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the role of institutions. And because a lot of you are from the same institution, this could actually give you ideas for things your institution might want to do <laughs> uh, using an activity called TRIS. I'll talk briefly about community building strategies, and then I'll end with a spiral journal where you're going to use pen, pen or pencil and paper to uh, reflect with me. Um, and so I actually forgot to get my own piece of paper, but it's okay, we'll, we'll get there in a minute. Um, and I might slow down or speed up depending on how you are responding. So um, I'll keep an eye out for what you're saying and see if you seem more interested in one part or another. The slides are available here. So if I speed up in a part and you wanna go back and look at it, you can just go back and look at it there. And they're open for commenting. So you can actually comment on them if you like. Thank you, Lisa, for putting the, the slides in the chat. So, you know, if there's something you want to go back to after this keynote, you can come back to it. If you want to share it with others, that's fine as well. Um, and I always like to just confirm this, that even though I'm the one who was doing the keynote, I'm inspired by a lot of people. And I try to acknowledge every time I've been inspired by someone, but there's still sometimes things that, you know, aren't very clear. So just, just saying that that's a key thing for me. All right. Heading into the chat of all. So the first question I have for you is, what's an important thing you learned or achieved in the past year? I'm gonna pause while you, uh, while you type this in the chat. And I'm actually going to run and get a piece of paper while you do that.
Oh, was I talking while I was muted? I thought I unmuted myself. <laughs> so the importance of health and patience, not to expect too much of yourself or anyone else, staying strong, teaching is super hard work. Yeah, especially in a pandemic, I agree. Resilience, for sure, Fedi, yeah, I agree. Karina saying, I don't have to be busy all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you can work well from home, Tom. Yeah, true, we all discovered that, right? Hopefully our bosses have to and they will let us do it in future. Well, being a priority, yes, Amrit. And Jill, how beautiful my surrounding area is. Lots of exploring. Yeah, we've started to appreciate a lot of the small things, health, important things in life. How to blur the background, Shabir. Yeah, that is useful. Um, positive thinking, <laughs> what and who is important to me. How to adjust work office, taking breaks. That's so important. Compassion with self and others, Hiba, yes. And Anna saying the importance of humor during difficult times. Yes, to bring smile and positivity. That we can succeed using online learning. Yeah, it's, it's different than what online learning used to be, but definitely we can do it. Uh, and Jill, I don't miss communing either. I agree. Staying away from COVID is something you learn. I don't know if you actually succeed in that necessarily. Resilience as a sport. Yeah, as a team sport, non-individual activity. I love that, Martha. And Irene, taking care of yourself. That's huge, yeah. Being kind to everyone, Yuka. And James, being more attention to myself again. Working with others online. The importance of breaks, this one's coming up a bit. And mental health is something I think we're all now paying more attention to than we used to before. And then human touch, and yeah. And I feel very bad, I think, for people who have had to be completely isolated with no, not able to, to be with family or things like that during this pandemic. I think it must've been really, really difficult and real struggle. Um, resilience and well-being. I think that's why a lot of people got pets. I'm, I'm a little bit late getting the guinea pig now, but. <laughs> Uh, resilience and well-being, Daphne, yes. And Rosemary, the importance of getting connected when I can't leave my home. Yeah, and so I think those of us who were already quite well connected online are kind of lucky because we already had networks of people that we're used to connecting with online rather than in person. And we have a rhythm and that just was going as normal. And what was new was people were used to seeing face-to-face -face that we suddenly had to connect with online who weren't used to it, I think. Sharon realized how much she relied on physical cues when teaching. Yes, I think this is one of the things that a lot of teachers have struggled with. And I think even going back post, uh, my institution is planning to go back face to face because everyone should be vaccinated by September. Uh, but with masks, you're still, you've got the body language, but you can't see their mouth. And that's still a big deal, I think. And the tone of voice and how well that projects is gonna be an issue as well, I think. Um, Go is saying learning to WFH more efficiently. I don't know what WFH is. I don't think I have the brain space to figure it out. <laughs> but time difference is a real consideration. Tom, yes, that is huge when you're working online. <laughs> and Anna's telling me never too late for guinea pigs. <laughs> Thanks. All right, engaging with students online, working from home. Oh, that's okay, that's obvious. Can we just call it remote work? But yeah, working from home, of course. Okay, thank you for that. All right, I'll move on to the next question which is just me answering this question is one of the most important things for me was that what helped me through the pandemic was knowing that I could be useful to others. And one of the key things was developing these community building resources that I'm, I think uh, someone has put in the chat. Thank you, Lisa, which I'll talk about later, but I'm curious if any of you have used them. It was done by Equity Unbound, which is a uh, grassroots organization that I co-founded, and 1HE, who are interested in just improving uh, education and teaching worldwide. Thank you, Jill, that's useful. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> and we keep growing them. So last semester, so these community building resources have demo videos, um, of people building community online using particular techniques and like adaptations and ideas for how to do it differently in templates and things. And last semester, I was teaching a graduate course where my students were actually teachers who teach English and Arabic. Um, and so uh, I asked them to contribute to these resources and they come out, came out with really good things as well. So, so there's a lot of new ones coming now. And I'll invite you later to contribute to them as well if you have ideas. All right, what's an unexpected act of compassion you noticed this past year? We were talking a lot about empathy and compassion and care. What's something that was unexpected for you? Obviously this past 15 months, not just the year.
students laughing at your jokes. <laughs> you think they're being compassionate by doing that? You think they weren't? <laughs> That's funny. Family and friends supporting each other after trauma. That has been overwhelming. I agree. Yes. And as you say that, both of you, I'm remembering that when I had COVID, my students were especially kind to me, um, offering advice, uh, those who had had COVID sort of giving me advice on what to do and just being generally kind to my like low energy. And I also had a day where I lost my voice and my students spoke. So I would type in the chat and the students would speak instead of me. So that was also a very nice thing that my students did for me. Jill's talking about how generous colleagues are, yeah, within and outside institutions. People generally ask how you are. Yeah, and this genuineness of asking how are you is so important, you know? Uh, getting help from colleagues, people taking time to listen as well as talk and how people are considered and supportive through tough times. Students writing, thank you for helping me emails a lot more. Yeah, and I actually had this very funny situation where a student who was one of my students in the first semester of the pandemic, you know, March, 2020, uh, who wrote a paper for another course a year later talking about my teaching, which was very interesting. And then that teacher shared it with me. So that was really lovely to see. And the students still remembered what I'd done for them during the pandemic and she would write about it in another course it was amazing. Kindness and generosity of colleagues, tolerance of each other's traumas. Team coffee chat meetings, yes, those can be really good versus the more structured ones and the ones where you might have some tension. Getting to know people at a different level. Yeah, I agree, Sharon. It's a different level when you have to do it this way. And friends rallying around to support, supportive colleagues. Yeah, students saying that our support made a difference to them. Yes. All right. And then my next question is, and I've gotten into this habit of using uh, GIFs in my keynotes because they're cute sometimes. If you were to create a documentary or book about your biggest challenges in 2020, what would it be called? This is actually one of the activities from the, I'm, I'm adapting one of the activities from the community building resources. There's one called log lines, which is like sort of the two sentence description of a movie or a book, um, but I'm just gonna make it a little easier and just tell you what's the title of your documentary or book. There's no manual, you know. <laughs> That's the name of the book, I think. Burnout, Jill, oh yeah, definitely burnout. Learning the technology. Appreciating the little things that keep us going, Anna. Yeah, I agree with that. I like that, Ramon. I don't know if I'm saying your name right. Ramon Rossi, sounds Italian. Uh, first survive, then thrive. Yeah, I like that a lot. I'm actually writing one, navigating love, loss, and life in lockdown. That's beautiful and it's alliteration, it's beautiful. <laughs> Damn COVID, okay. How do students mind and body language? We can't see or hear them. Yes, it's not snappy, but it's a good title. I think it's what people have been trying to do <laughs> for the past 15 uh, months, so. Uh, working in a jungle well around kids yes that that definitely is the case i have only one child but it's enough of a jungle just with her honestly to kill a coughing germ <laughs> i like that catherine try try again william that is simple but very important i agree turn the computer off now tony that's very funny rob oh in the absence of others oh steven in teaching space no one can see you scream your screen <laughs> i love that you guys are very quick at being creative with those titles. Teaching in time of long COVID. Yeah, I've had that long COVID symptoms thing where I had fatigue and lack of, um, who's on mute, not me. Oh, that's, you're on mute is the thing. That's the title of the book, right? <laughs> okay, I just realized that. <laughs> Another one, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, cool, you guys, I love these titles. I think we should collect them <laughs> and then see what we're gonna do with that. All right, and then this last one, what are you hopeful for uh, about post pandemic? I'm gonna take a sip of water. Yeah, going to Italy to see family, that's great. Hopefully that's uh, soon. Sustain some compassion tolerance for others. Yes, Anna, this for me is so important because I think it's one of those things that wasn't very at the surface. It came to the surface, but I hope it stays at the surface. And I think that people are still inviting me to talk about this because they 
sense the same thing. And I think um, Martha and Richard were talking about this as well. Because of being one world continues to grow. Yeah, saying bye to COVID. I'm, now I'm, I'm looking forward to that too. <laughs> I don't know how far, how long that's going to be though. Sustain compassion and care as well and for the humans and for the planet, yes. That there is a post-pandemic, yes, like not, I, I, I don't like it when people start talking about now as post-pandemic, because the pandemic is still there. Just because some people are vaccinated doesn't mean anything. We may have to get vaccinated again next year or whatever, like, I don't know. There's still countries where people are dying and still new strains, I agree with you. Stay considered and kind, but the flexibility and accommodations, yes, Jill, I agree that those kinds of things continue, right? For both staff and students, exactly. Because actually there's people experiencing trauma all the time and then there's the post COVID will still impact a lot of people. There'll be like post traumatic stress or whatever. Keeping all the good things we've learned. Yes, that too, Karina. Hope that both kindness and flexibility remain enjoying the company of others. I, I'm looking forward to that as well. I'm a very extroverted person. So that was kind of hard. I know a lot of introverts actually enjoyed having to, being able to be home for a bit. Um, to remember the lessons, no masks. I don't mind the masks so much, honestly, even though it's actually really hot um, in summer here, but the masks are not my biggest problem with this pandemic. I don't think it's gonna be nice teaching with a mask on though. Uh, being kind won't disappear, more flexibility, increased global cooperation. I hope so. And like, there's a lot that went wrong with that, I think. Hugs, yes. My daughter uh, once when early in the pandemic, when I said, what's the first thing you wanna do when the pandemic is over? She's like, I'll do a hugging party. So hugs are huge, yeah. Continuing changes that make things more inclusive would be great, yeah. And independent learning and flexibility. New ways of thinking about living, personal work life, hoping continues. I agree, like it's helped us like see priorities. So, okay, so I'll move on from here, but you can keep typing if you want. And I'll start talking about equ equity and equality. If you've attended my talks before, you've seen this one, I've been using it for years and adding to it, uh, but it tends to be useful for people who are seeing it for the first time, so. So this is, uh, you know, you've probably seen one of these before, uh, equity and equality, just a taller person. You've probably seen one that has a baseball field on the other side, but you know, I'm not American, so we don't play basic baseball here. I have no idea. You know, people watch this and they don't know what it is. So I thought an agriculture example is, is useful. Um, and as you can see, obviously the, the shorter people are not even trying to jump to get the apples so far away. Whereas the person in the middle of medium height when they all have the same uh, support, at least it's trying to reach it. But that equity, of course, is not giving everyone the exact same thing. And this is something that I think all parents know, even like with guinea pigs, there, there are two guinea pigs and they have, they require different kinds of support, you know, <laughs> and they're still tiny, but they're already different. They have different personalities and they need different kinds of help to get what they need. Uh, but this image is problematic with me because it's just about giving people different supports to reach the same thing. Because what if not everyone wants an apple? What if someone wants an orange? And what kind of ways can education allow for that different outcome that maybe uh, someone wants that's different from everyone else's? Who decides what it is that we're trying to help people reach? Um, and then during the pandemic, I thought one of the things that happens is that maybe someone uh, has an invisible need. They need care rather than apples. So they look like able-bodied and they look, um, I don't know, in all the ways privileged, but actually they're suffering trauma that we don't know about. And my daughter actually, she's seen this a lot. So one time she's like, an apple won't satisfy their appetite for, appetite for love. And so that's, that's an important one. I think that's been happening through the pandemic. It's so hard online to be able to tell. You can tell which ones don't have an internet connection, or at least they can tell you that they're having connectivity problems. You can tell the ones who have COVID right now, and so they can't come to class for a while. But you can't always tell if someone's got uh, mental health challenges unless they tell you or unless your university accommodations tell you. Uh, and you still don't always understand the details, right? And the image is kind of static because, you know, if you care about equity, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And it's a, there are no shortcuts. It's a lifelong commitment, right? So hopefully people who have started to, to do more of this right now will continue to do it post-pandemic. Um, and Mia Zamora and I, in our Open Ed 20 keynote, came up with this matrix of equity and care because we think equity alone and care alone are not enough. So I'll give you guys a chance to answer this question first. We had originally asked it on Twitter and then built a matrix out of what came out of that on Twitter. But I'll, I'll pause for a second and listen to you. What is equity without care and what is care without equity?
care without equity is superficial. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah. Equity with, with, I guess you mean without care is cold, right, Jill? You said with, but I think you mean without. Yeah, I can definitely see that. It's like you're doing it, but you don't actually have your heart in it. Yeah. Anna saying equity without care is imposing a supposed equity on others without checking what they need. I love this one, Anna, and it's going to come up again in a couple of other slides as we go on with this. That's a great one. And nobody actually said what you just said there, Anna. So I'm gonna, I might incorporate that into our paper that we're working on, <laughs> if that's okay with you. I'll check with you later, so I can have your permission. Equity without care is not equity. I like that, Amrit, I agree. It's gonna be problematic, right? Uh, Anna Seda is saying equity without care, a fake sense of everyone is the same, while equity means to me individual needs are different. Yes, I agree with that, Anna. And Chris is saying, sometimes the sounds and images are right, but without true care, don't necessarily come through in practice. Yes, that is a great one. And I'm gonna, you can keep typing if you want. I'm just gonna show you the matrix that we came up with out of lots of tweets by a lot of people. Some of the things that came out are tokenism, when you have equity without care, or diversity theater. So a little bit of like the sounds and the images look right, but the reality and the heart of it is not right. Uh, it can be systemic, like you need equity, even if you don't have care, to have a systemic kind of equity, like in the policies, but it can end up being lip services or, or be performative, again, like diversity theater. This is Sarah Ahmed who said that. And on the other hand, when you have care without equity, which didn't come up a lot, but I think someone mentioned it at the beginning, um, uh, it, it will be selective, like certain people will get the care and other people won't because there's no equity or it will be effective labor. Um, Jill earlier was talking about burnout. And if it's gonna be that, then some people are gonna get burnt out giving the effective labor because there isn't other people caring. And that person you know, who does care is, is doing a lot more of the labor than others. Or it can be also, if we think about it as ameliorative, it helps solve some problems, but it doesn't solve the systemic problem. And so when we tried to think, Mia and I, of what does equity with care look like, um, we think that might be what social justice ultimately needs to be. Um, it could be intentionally equitable hospitality, which I'll talk about in a second, that we developed um, at Virtually Connecting. Could be parity of participation, which is a little bit like what Anna Page was talking about in terms of undemocratic care, which Toronto talks about, um, is when you listen to what the people who need the care want before you decide how you're going to do it for them. So you don't just create an equitable system without checking in what the people actually want or need, right? So one example of care without equity, I think, is when an institution offers well-being workshops for employees, so that's giving care, but it does nothing to modify the work schedules and the practices that are creating that stress in the first place. And that's been one of the common things that I've heard in the pandemic. Jill is saying something really important too. Care is often provided by staff who have the least privilege. And honestly, uh, that applies in so many different ways. And Toronto, Joan Toronto talks about this a lot as well, is that the care work is often relegated to women and a lot of times not well paid, not well valued, not well recognized. I think those of us who are uh, academic developers uh, often have lower status than the professors that we support, for example, but we have to, we had to help them through this pandemic. I had to like I didn't have to, but I'm the kind of person who did this. Like I would answer phone calls at any time of night, like 10 p.m. or whatever, uh, to help them through this pandemic. Um, but yeah, but they, they're much better paid than I am. And they have much better working conditions than I do. So. Um, and care is not an unqualified good. I think care can sometimes be harmful. What do you guys think? And also, I just want to check with you, is my pace okay? Do you feel like I'm going too fast? Am I going okay? Pace is fine, thanks, Anna Page. Unwanted care can be, yes, unwanted care can be harmful. So this is my mother-in-law who's in her 80s. Um, she really would rather walk on her own. She's a little bit unstable sometimes when she's walking, but she doesn't want someone to hold her hand. She'll let my daughter hold her hand, but she won't let uh, one of us like me or my husband hold her hand. She wants to feel independent. And sometimes that care is stifling or it's not what she wants. Uh, Catherine is saying, you can care too much to the detriment of your own well-being. Thank you, yes, yes. And I think someone recently was telling me about how I was caring for someone so much that I 
sort of got them used to me being caring that way. And then they expect everyone to care for them that way, which is not fair to them, to the others and to myself, because I'm giving so much of myself that I'm burning myself out as well. Thank you. And care can harm when it's misplaced, can be taken as pity, which some people don't want. Yes, I agree. That is very true. It's not genuine sometimes. Too much care could prevent autonomous growth. And Marie, yes. And that's, I think, happens with children and with students as well. Like you care so much that you don't give them a chance to make mistakes and take risks and fall and, and learn on their own and be able to be independent. And Anna saying, when we assume someone has problems because we care about them and we infer what is best for them, yes, without considering they might want something else. Again, I'm so happy with this, um, this element of what do, uh, what do the care receivers want uh, that is coming out from both Anna's and others as well. Um, Chris, depends on what we mean by care. I imagine care sessions being triggering for some people with buried trauma and could snowball beyond what the care is qualified to deal with. That is very interesting, Chris, and also more important with some of the things that I'm going to talk about later when we ask for peers to care for each other because you can't always have a qualified person. There aren't probably enough qualified people in institutions. Like, and in, we have a student well being center and they're overwhelmed. So teachers have had to do some of that work and they don't have the psychology background, but you know, you have the in intuition to care. But if, yeah, if you receive, you know, you're at the end of something that you're not capable of responding to, that can happen. Uh, and Hiba Shimi saying, care is effective when practiced from the perspective of the receiver. I love that expression. I love the way you've expressed that. Um, Allison, adding to Catherine's point about caring passion to others when there's not self-care. Yeah, keeping your own cup not overflowing, we say here. Yes, I like that. I certainly reached a tipping point during pandemic where I need to turn back to myself. That's very true. And I've heard a lot of people say, like, what's care if you don't care about yourself? You know, care for yourself. Um, and that's true. And I think with, again, with parenting, that's one of the very obvious things. If you don't care for yourself, then you're not going to be able to take care of your children. Uh, so you have to take care of yourself even for them, even if you're not doing it for your own self. Um, this is uh, from Abby Elder talking about equity without care, as in when the system was changed so that everything can work for everyone's needs, but those in charge don't communicate those changes that they've been made. So the equity of the system may only be utilized by the ones who know about it. Um, so the true equity might require something more. It still needs a little bit of care. So can you think of examples of equitable policies and governments or institutions or anywhere you know, or even within a class that can only be utilized by a few? It's either taking a really long time for someone to type. <laughs> we don't have a lot on your mind. I'll I'll send I'll say a few, but I'll also wait a minute. Yeah. So Rosemary is saying in most areas adjustments for disabilities can be used only if you prove your disability. That's a great point. And then you have the the proving your disability is a burden in and of itself. So if you don't have policies that already are accommodating by default, uh, then you're going to need to apply for those um, policies. And your disability might not be obvious. Yeah, that's true. It's definitely not necessarily obvious to the teacher. Um, I had the situation this semester where I had a blind student join one of my classes, but I didn't know she was blind until I was in the session. So I couldn't like prepare anything for that. Um, and then by the time I emailed her to check in after I got the accommodation letter, uh, she had dropped the course. She didn't even come and talk to us about what she was worried about. She just dropped the course because she was worried uh, that she wouldn't do well and I felt really sad because I didn't have a chance to even you know sort of work with it Policies they're not promoted enough so most people don't know about them yeah and so speaking of disabilities again in my institution we have a policy where like someone who's hard of hearing can have a buddy to support them and of course when you're teaching online you need things like closed captioning and things like that and the teacher who was trying to figure this out I was trying to help her but it turns out that this stuff exists on campus but she didn't know and I didn't know so it took her a while to realize that she could ask for things like that. Bullying policies. If early careers bullied by their line manager, often they do not use the policy due to fear of retaliation. Yes. And I think similarly, uh, harassment policies, because you there's even if you have the policy in place, there's so much ideological oppression that women think they can't report and interpersonal sometimes because some people will discourage them from reporting. So yeah, that can happen. 
some online cloud provision is done to ensure equal access, but then there's not training to help you access this. Yeah, that's true as well. Sometimes the stigma of being classified disabled, definitely, and especially with mental health, right? Like if it's an if it's an obvious disability like blind or deaf, that's probably easier to report because it's obvious or or physical disability that's that's visible, but not online. It's not as obvious online, and definitely not if it's like a mental health, uh, like a learning difficulty or something. So this is the one I was talking about. <laughs> All right, so going back to this parity of participation, which is originally Nancy Fraser's term, uh, I think Nell Noddings, who's one of the people who talks about pedagogy of care, says, prefer to advise do unto others as they would have done unto them, which has been mentioned a lot today. And I say do unto students as they would have done unto them. And then give them equal, you know, equal voice in influencing decision making. Um, I'm going to go through this one really quickly. Just thinking about levels of care and intentional equity can happen at the course philosophy or design or the planning phase before you even meet the students. But then there's also habitual practices in class, including like habitually checking in with students on um, how they're feeling about what you're doing and what they'd like to change, for example, and responding in particular situations where care is needed. And this is maybe something you can't plan ahead, but it's like how you respond when the situation happens. And this is one that can go bad, honestly, <laughs> like things can go wrong. Uh, and then also sometimes it has to happen in private with a situation where a particular student needs a particular thing and it's not something that you can generalize to the whole class. Uh, but the more you do it at the planning phase and the habitual practices, the less likely you're going to need to deal with these um, personal situations. They'll happen, but they won't happen as much, I think. I love this quote from uh, White and Toronto that not there isn't one model of care that's going to work for everyone and humans varying their abilities to receive give and receive care and that's just the way it is it doesn't mean that people shouldn't be responsible for these things and so things like you know women caring a lot more of this than, than men is for example not acceptable chris you're saying when here in scotland number of employers are offering work to graduates as part of government kickstart scheme which means that a graduate has to be eligible for universal credits yeah and have very low or no income and not have savings yeah so this cuts a lot of graduates who are on zero hour contracts but happen to have some savings so yeah, fewer internships, new jobs related to their degrees are available to graduates who are not on UC as a result. Yeah, it's those, those extreme cutoffs, right? That make it difficult for someone who, I don't know how they decide on the cutoffs as well. It feels like uh, arbitrary sometimes. And then on the systemic level, there's, there's one thing that we can do is just like advocate for caring or equitable policies institutionally um, and supporting others and forming allyships when you can't directly influence policy. Um, and then speaking up in certain situations where something unfair is happening to someone, even if it's not you. And then sometimes it's risky to speak up publicly, but you can do it privately, right? So these are so important not to think about care as something that's just the purview of an individual in their classroom, but also as we all have a role in our institutions at whatever level of these things that we are able to do safely. And this uh, is another quote that I really like, which is justice needs care because justice requires the empathy of care in order to generate its principles. So this reminds me of, I think it was Jill who was saying that it's, it's cold um, to have equity without care. Okay, and thank you, Lisa, for uh, intentionally equitable hospitality. So this is the work of myself, uh, Autumn Keynes, Rebecca Hogue, Helen DeWard, and Christian Friedrich. Um, and it was built from our experience with Virtually Connecting, which is a hybrid uh, grassroots movement to enhance access to conferences, ensure that people who normally, their voices wouldn't be heard at conferences would be heard. Um, but it applies to education as well. And uh, very much if you're gonna be doing things like high flex or dual delivery, but also in any context, just starting with the hospitality piece and recognizing that when you're the teacher or the person facilitating a session, you're the host, you're building a space, you're making sure that everyone feels welcome. It's your responsibility to be hospitable, right? And whom do you listen to or involve as you create that space? How do you make sure each person feels welcome? Um, some things like informal spaces that are called like, oh, the, the pub at night or something like online meetings that are called that are exclusive for me. And I'm sure a lot of Muslims here feel the same way. Like, why are you calling it that? Versus when you call it like a tea break, even if you don't drink tea, you're not going to be offended to go to something like that for example, and you can't always anticipate these things, right? So that's why it's the part of you have to listen to the right people, whether they are colleagues who are from diverse backgrounds or your own students or both really. But like in the planning phase, you can ask past students or you can ask uh, 
colleagues who are different from yourself as you plan things to make sure that they're culturally relevant or um, hospitable. Um, and I, it's, I would be interested also in Harriet Watt, I don't know if, if people take classes across the three campuses and if what kind of cultural preparation you have for you know, people in Dubai and Malaysia and, and Scotland working together, or are they completely separate where each one has their own teacher and own group of students? Especially now that everything's online, I wonder if what you did with that. Um, and then the intentional aspect is really important that we set that intention to be equitable and we walk the talk, recognizing that we have to keep checking if what we're doing is what's happening. Because you can't say, you can say, I didn't realize the first time, but you can't keep saying, I didn't realize. That means you're not noticing, you're not putting it in mind, and yet you're not setting your intention strongly enough and checking if what you're doing is working or not. And then the equitable part, of course, we talked about. And I think the important part here is to think it's not about being hospitable to all students, which you can do that too. But the important thing is to recognize the inequities faced by each student, which might be different than what you were expecting. Right? And for me, one of the inequities uh, that a lot of people faced at the, you know, around summer last year, summer in the Northern Hemisphere, obviously in the Southern Hemisphere, it wasn't summer, but access to educational development support, no matter how big any um, academic development unit was, they had never been prepared, I think, to support that many people all at once. And people were all gonna be teaching online fully for the first time in a lot of places. And that's why there was an urgent need for this community building online with care and equity, which is a lot of people who'd never taught online before had never heard of, had, had never learned how to, build community online and the online teaching um, practices from before were developed in a very different context where people had a life face-to-face -face where a lot of it was asynchronous and not synchronous. They had a lot of time to plan and develop and design. That was not the case. And that's why we developed the community building resources, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and this is again, democratic care, which is that concept of care receivers will have different ideas of how they want to receive care. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. So I'll just talk a little bit about this equitable care and compassion by design. Um, and I know a lot of people uh, in this call will know this about uh, prayer and Islam. Uh, I wrote a blog post recently about prayer and Islam as something that has soft deadlines. Like you can pray on time and you have a, a large chunk of time within which you're still considered on time until the next prayer comes. But the thing is, even with that soft deadline, if you miss it, you can make it up the same day right when you remember it or you can make it up the next day and I was thinking about how if that's the ritual in Islam then this is maybe something we should be doing more of in our classes because what I noticed with my nine-year-old child is that recognizing that she can make it up made her realize oh my god I can actually pray five times a day even if I miss a prayer and so she can achieve that versus beforehand she kept feeling like if she misses it she's done she has no way to make it up she's doomed all right it's just going to be one prayer today that's just the way it's going to be um, and so I was thinking that this is maybe how students feel as well, if they feel like something is within their reach, more likely to work hard and try to do it, even if they know they're not going to do it perfectly or on the original deadline. And so Sakin Al Haddad, who's based in, uh, um, in Australia, called it compassion by design. And so I kind of like that term. It's a term that's been used, but not very often. Uh, and I liked what she said here. And so I'm wondering what compassion by design looks like in your teaching or in your practice, whatever your practice is. So I'll wait and see what you type. I like that, Sharon. So working with students to create rubrics, how do you want to get marked? Sharon, if you're comfortable unmuting, do you want to talk a little bit more about how that was received by students? Or you can type in the chat, whichever you're more comfortable with. No, I'm happy to, to unmic myself. Um, I embedded it in one of the courses this year, and I ran a session with them brainstorming how to do um, this. So this was specifically for a, a task 
an assessment task that centred around making something for social media. Um, so I was very interested in how they understood social media versus how I understood social media and kind of thinking about the different ways in which we could kind of include the focus that they wanted to get from it that still fitted with the ILOs. Um, mm -hmm. And they really reacted really well with it. And, and I found actually markings being a bit easier. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because they understand the criteria because they set them, right? Definitely, yeah. They, they're that's just, they're much more uh, connected with it. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Thank you for sharing, Sharon. Um, so there's things about generous generosity with one-on-one -on -one support, the intentional design point, adding flexibility, voice choice, accessibility. Uh, Ramon, are you willing to unmute and say a little bit about what you're saying there? This planning ahead of time, not making it as a reaction. Yes, you're gonna laugh because this is my husband's. <laughs> it's Virna. <laughs> oh, it's Virna. I was like, yeah, th that sounds like Sorry. Virna's cousin. <laughs> it's, it's my husband's account, and I can't. It doesn't let me change the name. Sorry, about that. sorry. No problem. It's good to uh, see you. I, I was it sounded to... like you actually. <laughs> uh, well, Tell I think a little I, bit more. I think you know where I come from. Obviously, the, the the point for me, this is what I'm working with many colleagues, is that that a lot of the times what happens is we we design you know a course or however macro or micro learning experience and then we realize that you know we missed this and we didn't actually um, design with you know care for example accessibility etc like at the start so then it becomes a reaction we're, we're constantly reacting to issues that come up so this is i think where there is quite a gap that people uh, don't necessarily take the time um, maybe they have not been equipped for uh, with time and abilities to actually design learning intentionally as you talk about you know with with care for example and these other aspects like actually at design point rather than you know reaction thank you verna and verna <laughs> writes really well about this and verna could you post some of your resources that you've created on this oh I thank you very... okay <laughs> i will thank you thank you and someone recently by the way i've known verna for throughout this pandemic as someone who's very generous with sharing and also collecting other people's expertise uh, and someone recently showed me, hey, look what I found. I'm like, yes, I know Verna, she's a good friend, you know, uh, because your work is reaching a lot of people. So thank you for that. So there's several of you who talked about listening to students, setting soft deadlines, being flexible with deadlines, uh, being giving one-on-one -on -one support. Um, I like what Anna is saying here about telling students how to improve their work rather than telling them what's wrong. This kind of feedback is really important. Um, yeah, and um, clear communication helps a lot for sure. Chris talks about a water cooler channel and that can be really useful, I think. So that, yes, I've done that as well. Like having a, I use Slack, but with WhatsApp with my graduate students in Slack for my undergrads. Uh, negotiating, Amrita, yes. Um, and Jill talking about accessible materials in different formats. That's definitely helpful, of course. Just predicting ahead of time so that you don't have to react again uh, when you have a student who has a disability or something. Uh, providing space ready for uh, support receiving support offering as well as receiving I think that was really important because it's not just that people need to come for support but people need to be able to give support and I think strangely giving care in itself is is fulfilling you don't want to overdo it that you're always giving and not receiving but having space for both and the reciprocity of that is really important as well um, Allison trying to relate students on a journey right not expectations of what they need to know. That's true. That's a really important point as well, especially if you have like international students who have different backgrounds. Yeah, dialogue, a lot of dialogue at the beginning and being open and approachable. So your attitude also gives students, yeah, that, that feeling. Yes. I love this. Allison's talking about how when she does polling, there's always an I don't know, or I hope you would discuss this as an option. So it's okay not to know. That's that's a really good way of like creating a safe space for people to begin with, right? And consistently checking in with students, definitely, especially those who have invisible learning needs. You don't know who they are, but you can just be checking in all the time. And you'll capture that. All right, so there's an activity called TRIZ. Uh, it's a liberating structure, which I'll talk about in a second, but it's about um, going backwards. So instead of saying, how can we enhance equity compassion by design, you would ask, how could an institution hinder equitable care or compassion by design? So I'm not asking you about your own, oh, Verna, you changed your name, good. <laughs> um, is you can, what can an institution do if it wants to hinder equitable care or compassion by design? So normally the way we do this is we do it in breakout rooms and small groups and everything, but we won't have time to do that today. 
Uh, but I'm just asking you to tell, type in the chat, are there ways in which an institution might hinder equitable care? So I'll, I'll give an example until folks start typing. So for example, departments that require uh, that all the courses have like three exams uh, weighted at like I don't know, 25% or whatever, strict deadlines for assessment submission. So if the institution requires that, that would be a problem. Uh, requiring the use of like proctoring for exams, for example, would be one of those examples. I don't know what you have actually, Harriet Watt, I forgot to ask. Um, and Jill, yeah, insisting all students receive the same support rather than recognizing people need different support. Um, thank you, Verna, for including those, uh, that link to those videos. And setting too many rules and regulations, Steve, I agree with that. Camera on policy, thank you, Allison. Yes, why would you do that? Are you not realizing why students may not want to have their cameras on? There's so many, like if you ever ask your students why they don't like to have their cameras on, you wouldn't ask them to, you wouldn't force them to have it on. I just watched my child uh, struggling with it and that has influenced me a lot. Like she's, she is required to have her camera on for her online classes and she hates it and all of her classmates hate it. So I've never asked my students to turn their camera on unless they want to. Um, and they, they, I always survey them and understand why they don't want to. That's the important thing. I know a lot of, in my university, some of the departments are requiring it, but some individual faculty are not because they don't think it's right. So that's good. Um, and uh, being flexible, no buffer assignments, submission, yeah. Live sessions which favor particular time zones. Roddy, yes, that is definitely one of those things. And Chris is saying in Switzerland, worked for a couple of business schools that had a policy of failing 30% of students. Oh my God. Yeah, I mean, this is like the bell curve uh, way of grading, right? Normative grading. It's like, if you're grading people to the average, that means that half the people are below average and rather than based on standards that they meet or not or whatever. Okay, I am almost done actually. And I'm gonna run through this really quickly. And then I, I'm going to do a spiral journal activity with you using a pencil and paper or pen and paper. So these are the community building resources. We're saying people vary in their ability to receive care and give care. And we think teaching online was one of the things a lot of people didn't know how to give and receive care. And so we did these community building resources with ideas for how to do introductions, how to consider safety, doing warm ups, setting the tone, and ongoing community building ideas. I'm just, I already asked if some people have used them, so we know. Just recognizing that you know people can do introductions a lot of times synchronously, but asynchronously they'll have more time to think about what they want to say. Some of the activities that are really um, popular, like story of your name or what kind of animal, which actually Irene Mao had suggested here, you need to think about for whom this might this be safe or unsafe. Because, uh, for example, in South Africa, the what kind of animal would be offensive. Um, the safety considerations might be uh, confusing or unsafe for people who are trans and they've changed their name, for example. So thinking about all these things and something like a tour of where you are is fun, but some people don't want to turn their camera on or they're not feeling okay showing their home and things like that. So these are, these are important things to keep in mind. Um, and we have like warm up activities that we think, whether you do them synchronously or asynchronously, so they're always checking in with students offering this diversity of different ways, doing text-based visual and oral to give people different ways of doing it. There's spiral journal, which we'll do now, and then doing things like that are kinesthetic, like uh, theater of the oppressed techniques, like the op opposites is like giving students something different to do every time makes, makes them interested. And then there are energizing ones uh, like improv, uh, like what you did earlier today with the uh, title of your book or whatever, or like improv building a story together. PowerPoint karaoke, if you've never tried it, it's a lot of fun. And uh, just always thinking that some people may be excluded by some of these choices so try to be give a diversity of them, you know. And uh, there was one that some of you contributed to uh, from Harriet Watt and uh, Rosemary and I decided together sharing an object from home that helps your well being and I can see there were several related to sports and act, staying active like uh, there's one on yoga, a lot of the outdoors music, crafting, and plugged on Instagram. And when you share things like that, the pictures are inspiring and people get to know a little bit about each other, but they also learn things. So you can get like a link to a YouTube video that you might use yourself, you know? So it's a way for students to share something useful to each other with each other and share something of themselves as well. Other things like setting the tone, 
students know what kind of course to expect, like inviting them to annotate your syllabus, talking about trauma with them, uh, encouraging gratitude journaling has helped my students and my daughter a lot. A uh, third place is kind of like what someone was saying earlier, like WhatsApp and water cooler places. Um, and community guidelines that you co-develop with students. Um, and then like sort of surveying them and getting feedback before and during the course. Um, and I'm gonna skip through the ongoing thing, but just to remind us that check out the liberating structures if you've never used them before. Um, and we need to keep sort of changing up the way we do things because just having a general discussion, whether on a discussion board or synchronously can get old and not necessarily equitable. And this is an invitation to contribute to these community building resources anytime. And now let's try one. So this one's called Spiral Journal. If you've got a pencil and paper, I'm just gonna unshare for a second so I can show you what I'm doing with this paper. Um, if you don't have a piece of paper, you can just write this anywhere. It's not a problem. <laughs> All right, so piece of paper, I'm going to fold it up once like this and then another time like this. And then you're going to have a little bit in the middle over here, okay? And what we're gonna do is we're going to draw a spiral in the middle. Um, oops, I did not mean to do that, but this is also a liberating structure in development, just so you know. And it's inspired by Linda Berry, if you've ever read her work. So drawing a spiral in the journal in the middle, just slowly, I'm gonna just pause for a minute while you do that. Just don't fill the page because you're gonna use the other parts of the page for other things, but just, I'm gonna mute and give you a minute to, to just draw a tight spiral and just take your eyes away from the screen for a minute. It's gonna be good. Okay, you can stop spiraling now. And I'm just gonna ask you different questions and ask you to fill in the, the quadrants with, uh, of the paper with the question. So the first question is right now I'm feeling, just write down how you're feeling, one or two words, I guess. One thing I can do differently going forward is I would like to advocate for And finally, I'd normally give you more time, but we're running out of time. <laughs> and finally, a question or challenge on my mind is, okay, I hope you've had enough time to, to respond to all the questions. Um, and now I'm gonna ask you to Underline or circle one thing that stands out for you from what you've written there. So this is like, you've done a small journal right now. Um, and I use this in my classes and I use it with my daughter as well. It's kind of nice to look back and see what stands out for you here. Okay. And then I'm just going to say, share one thought in the chat after doing this exercise. And this is just my last slide. <laughs> 